We're coming full circle and now I'm here at Northwind creating a display garden, which is amazing and I'm so honored. I wanted to lay it all out with you, but then I'd be huffing and puffing and not be able to <laughs> talk about it as I was doing it. And so I just, I have the framework here and just kind of talk about the system uh, that I did and what I laid out first and kind of some thought processes that I have when I'm creating a new garden or a design. Was, I like to use like blocks, which means like a larger area. So there's kind of like two, two or three different types of plants. There's block plants that you, you know, you put more than like three or five plants together. It's like, you know, eight, 10, 20, 50. It depends on how big of a scale you have. So depending on, you know, at Millennium Park, I had to stretch it out more. And so it's a larger space. So if you want it to look a little more cleaner and, uh, and have repetition, it's good to have larger groups. So at Millennium Park, I might use like 50 plants in one group. And then in this instance, I might use 20 to 25. And then at a home garden, I might use five or seven in a group. And all my projects, we take, we have like a master plan, a laminated master plan. And, you know, today I didn't have one for this. And I kind of scoped out the nursery and the candy store. And I was like, oh, what am I going to use? And so I use a spray, you know, the spray painting wand, I think they call it. And, and I just kind of feel the space and what movement do I want? You know, we're going to come down this path. And so I use this Japanese forest grass, the Konakloa Macra. It's just the green, the green variety, which is my favorite and it's the most vigorous for our zones. And that gets about three to four foot tall. And it just, any little bit of breeze, it just sways in the wind. And so it's just like to have that movement in the garden and you can hear it and it's beautiful. And it has a gorgeous like gold fall color and it stays through the winter and it blows all winter long with snow sitting on top of it. It's just stunning. And um, so I have, you know, I created, created some movement with this, having it kind of start at the corner and then kind of flow out here. And then, and then it connects and there's another little group there and then the third group here. So you like to, it's good to do groups of like three or five. So that odd number feels more natural. If there was just two, it's like, well, where am I supposed to go from there? So having these three groups and then having them staggered. And so this one's in the front, that one's kind of in the middle and then that one's a little bit further out, but they all kind of connect and flow through. So I did that in groups and that's a great one to do a group because they all knit together and I said it creates that beautiful river flow look. And then I also did, I used Aster Twilight. So this, just in this pot, it tells you what this plant does. So it's rhizominous. So you can see how full the pot is. So this one is also one that you'd want to put in a group. So this plant grows rhizomes and so it's going to be a little bit more competitive. So if you put this next to a very delicate plant that needs its space or needs to be something that's more of a clumper, it's gonna run it over. So that's why I used it in a large group. And then, um, yeah, and so, and this is an aster that blooms in the fall. So I've got my fall color with this aster twilight and it's purple and it'll create just this beautiful mound that almost looks like it was hedged by a hedge trimmer and it sits about like three and a half foot tall and then it's just like a beautiful dome of purple like soft purple and then once the flowers fall off then there's a beautiful star-shaped uh, straw-like seed head and then that seed head the the structure stays all winter long and then that seed head just glows when the sun hits it in the winter you can just see that like that straw just like lights up and so it's just so beautiful so those little things that i share with my clients like it just makes you that much more and deeply knowledgeable about the garden, in love with your plants. And the more knowledge you have, the more you just want to, I don't know, love your garden more. It's amazing. So I did three groups of those. I kind of put them, you know, and it's okay to put taller plants in the front. It doesn't have to be tall, medium, short, or, you know, tall, medium, short, and stair step it down. So it's good to have that movement and flow and um, different heights. And then another group plant that I did is the Aruncus Horatio, or it's a, it's a Aruncus, so goat's beard, misty lace. And I love this goat's beard because of the fine foliage. And this one gets about three foot max, and it's got these beautiful white plumes on it. So a stilby is a great plant, but it likes a lot of moisture. And so we all want to put them in our garden, and then we just keep trying another one until one hopefully works. But I like to use this as a substitute for a stilby because 
It's got the beautiful white plumes and I, I made a smaller group because it's a very strong uh, flowering. When it flowers, it's like very powerful. So then it doesn't need to be as big of a group. So even if you put three or five in a small group in your garden, it's gonna light it up in June and July. And then keep the seed heads up all winter long. You'll have that beautiful pyramidal form. So having all these different forms is also really important. So I have this pyramidal upright form and then I have the aster which is a dome and so it's got that kind of horizontal form and so having the different forms really makes your garden more dynamic and then I also use epimedium uh, barren wart here it's the uh, rubrum the red one and I, I use that in a group because I love that it creates a low mat ground cover and the foliage looks very uniform it's a nice clean look and so if you have all these grasses and all these other textures going on this really kind of tones it down a little bit so if you have a few groups of this just kind of um, adds that beautiful um, simplicity and it blooms super early so then this is your early spring color and then after it blooms the new foliage comes out and it has this gorgeous like heart-shaped red foliage and then as the season progresses this will turn green and then it'll pop out a new cluster of the red foliage. So all season you're just getting these little bursts of red foliage, which is just dynamite. Um, Are these sun or shade lovers? This is all shade, yep. All shade. Yeah, so this is like a part shade woodland edge garden, you know, from where we're at. And so it'll get like midday, like four to six hours of sun. So anything over eight is full sun. And, uh, and some of these things can do, like the Aster Twilight is very versatile. It can do like wet, dry, sun, shade, like it's, amazing um, and I use it everywhere but um, so that you know but then sometimes when they get more sun they just need a little bit more moisture so most of this here is drought tolerant depending like if we don't get rain for July August into September like it's gonna want a little bit of water um, in July but I think um, yeah most of this is very drought tolerant and will take care of itself and isn't gonna need to be on a weekly schedule of watering um, so and then once so those are the block plants that i have the different groups that i put throughout and then the scatter plants is the other thing that i uh, use and that's for seasonal colors just like a little pop of color that you might place somewhere kind of like here in this uh, this echinacea or the uh, epimedium here i have popping out the polygonatum and so this has got this beautiful arching habit and so it's a totally different architectural form it's a very strong form you can see there's some over there this is the uh, this is polygonatum biflorum, and this is polygonatum multifada. So it's a different one. This is like six foot tall, five to six foot, and then this one is two to three. So yeah, this is a great one, and it blooms in the spring, and then it gets black berries uh, where the flowers are. There's three black berries for each. So as that stair steps, and, um, you know, as they get taller and arch over, and so this is more of a formal look and has that clean look, and then these will be arching out of it, giving it a new dimension. And so it's okay to mix the plants a little bit. So I've, mat I've added three inside the group and then I've dotted one out to make it look more natural. That's like, oh, one seeded in over here. And, um, and so, and then this has like an amazing, gorgeous gold fall color as well. So just multi-season interest, gorgeous plant, can't go wrong. And then um, another one, this is more, another architectural uh, dotted plant is Hosta Summon Substance. And some in substance is one that gets like three and a half to four foot wide and two foot tall and the leaves can get like that big. So a lot of people, they'll come over to my house they're like, I don't know about the big leaf hostas. And to me, I love the big leaf hostas because they just add such a dramatic. So everything else has kind of got, you know, normal size, couple inch leaves. And then this just adds some drama. And so you don't need many of them. So I've only added three into a space this big. So if your space was double, then you would add probably about six of them. So these two will kind of fill this whole space. And um, yeah, so that just adds that nice heavy um, form. And then I've added in for the Aquilegia, um, I, I can't remember the name of this one, Corbett, Corbett. And so like Aquilegia is a great one just to sprinkle in because they don't always come back every year, but they will seed around. So this is one that will just like, if there's a hole somewhere, it'll come up and if some year you're like oh I have a few too many I kind of want to scale it back because I like when it's just dappled through here then you can remove some so you're the artist in the garden it, you know it doesn't have to be perfect and so um, 
have as many as you want or as little as you want, but I love just this soft yellow dangling above everything and it blooms in the spring. So pairing it with something like the Japanese forest grass, have I have them in there, the Japanese forest grass takes a little bit longer to get taller. So that's the perfect thing to light up that area in the spring. And then when the Hakona Kloa gets taller, it'll cover this up. When this doesn't look like anything in the summer, you won't even notice it was there because I paired it with something that's going to cover it up and um, and kind of give it interest when something else isn't going on. So um, that's another great individual plant. Uh, the um, hellebores, the Lenten rose, is a great semi-evergreen. So this one stays, it's a really thick, hardy texture and it's got this beautiful world leaf on it. And so if you put this one in, um, just dabble a few in, but it gives you like they, one of the first things to flower in the spring. So early April, late March, and you got that beautiful, gorgeous, this one's heritage red. And so it's got a gorgeous red flower and the flower comes up before the foliage. And in our, our climate, they do get a little bit of brown. And so you'll cut those old ones off after once, you know, polar vortex hits. Um, you'll cut some of those off and then they'll send a whole new shoot of uh, the gorgeous foliage out. And then the flowers last forever because they just, they just hang on there and they'll turn to like a dull green or a soft cream color after they've been on there for a while. Um, and then I love, 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 love this hookera. Roy turned me on to this. He, a lot of hookeras are disappointing because they are annuals and they're not, they you know, advertise them as perennials, but there's so much breeding happening. And this one, the parentage of this plant is strong and lives here. And Roy's told me he had it at Ball Seed in St. Charles or in Chicago, West Chicago, lived for eight to 11 years. And he was like, I, he's like, you know, when he puts these hookah on the ground, you're like dead, 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 you know, cause you just, you can't trust them anymore. But this is Watermelon Carnival. And Watermelon Carnival has been one of my favorites because you can see just in this planting, the dimension that these three little groups of three, it's just like a little pop of color. And they're uh, Velosa, so Hookera Velosa is the really strong parentage. So any of the Hookera that have the Velosa in it, it's gonna say that's a stronger variety for you to try. And so this one, I had it at Millennium Park and it was like after the polar vortex, it still looked exactly like this and had its color, no brown leaves on it. Amazing, like I, I've been amazed at all, all season long, just, and I have, I, I added large swaths of them and a planting I did in groups of like 50 and the dimension and the color that it gives me all winter long is amazing. And so definitely, um, that, this one blooms in, um, in June and it's like, a, um, like red stems and it's got like a soft, like a, like a white pinkish flower and it's really nice. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. So there's one little flower on that one, but it is a full flower set that comes on. And so I like to just scatter these among grasses. And um, so, yeah, so that's a great one. Long lived, What's strong plant, watermelon carnival. <laughs> they come up with some crazy names. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's a great plant that is awesome. And then, and then this is Astrantia. So Strontia and it's a gorgeous, so you can just see the light when you have this dappled shade, the way the sun hits this stuff. And then when it moves in the wind, it's just so beautiful. And you don't need to have a huge mass of these. And, and you can if you want, but I think I love using this as a dotted plant and these bloom, start blooming in June and then they sporadically bloom throughout the season. So just pops of color. And so I just kind of dabble them in and, you know, I got like, so I kind of put like two there and one here. So they're in close proximity to each other, but yet, they still have some distance and then they kind of draw your eye through the whole space. So like this one connects to this one and then it connects to that one and it brings your eye through the whole space. So every season, I want your eye to catch whatever is happening to bring you through the space and make you want to see more, enjoy more. Um, when is there one called Pink? I'm sorry. That's a, it's a Strontia Pink Sparkling. It's pink Sparkler, yeah, they have them at the nursery. Um, Thank you. Yeah, it's a great one, just soft pink. Gorgeous, and they last such a long time. They probably last like a month flowering, each flower. Um, and then I added, yeah. Safe to assume everything that you have laid out, this is um, all compatible for our zone. Yep, yeah. So this is everything that Roy's grown, thinks, yeah, thrive here. He's not gonna, he doesn't sell anything that is going to, you know, not do well in the, you know, where it should be belonging. And so, like I said, this is good for, 
you know, loam to clay soil. You know, some things can handle more clay than others, but uh, generally this can all kind of handle the soil for here and is, is hardy to zone probably 4B because I'm, I'm from zone 4B in Iowa and I grow all of these things there. So very tough. Um, and then this is Christmas fern and I love this one because this is also, it might not look like much now, but it's an amazing, amazing plant and it's a native fern that we have and it only gets about 12 inches tall. And then, um, and it's kind of a clumper. So I'll have like a nice group here and this is also semi evergreen. So you're gonna have your green with this. And so people always say, oh, I need my boxwood. I need my evergreens and that are, you know, shaped like lollipops and over trimmed. And, and I like maybe the look of this or, you know, something like a perennial or like, like I said, those beautiful aster groups that are in that dome that kind of create a shrub like uh, look. Um, so you can put your Christmas lights on your perennials. <laughs> The fern? Is that for, you know, yeah, these ferns are actually drought tolerant once they're established. So after they're in for about a year, they're drought tolerant and it's like a foot by a foot and they they live forever. I mean, they're if you go out in the woodlands and they're in a happy spot, you know, they're awesome. And I love putting them like around the root flare of a tree because it just looks so natural having those, that fern just kind of spill down from that and then move into the carex, that texture. Um, so I've got small little groups of that again, like five here, three there, one there. And so it's just drawing your eye through. And this is a lot of like individual plants. I, maybe probably about as many as I would use or maybe a few more than I would normally use. But it just depends what you like. I was just kind of trying to show you a lot of different things that you can add in here. And then I also did um, the, this is a native, here it's called Thylictrum dioecum, uh, meadow rue, and it's just got this beautiful, like soft, light airiness. And I like to put them in like small groups of three and five. And after they're like a year or two old, some of them are male, some are female, and they get these beautiful, like I don't even know how to say it, like a firework of flowers on top, and they're like a green color, green yellow with purple inside of it, and they just dangle. And the filaments that are hanging from the flower just dangle like a chandelier and it's like a whole situation on top is so amazing and so I love this it's a great native plant that's underused and just so I mean that foliage is just so gorgeous so so little clusters of that and then I think I have one more yeah the geranium so the perennial geranium I love tiny monster um, it's a great one to use as a dotted plant. It's got this beautiful foliage and then it has like a roseanne flower. You know, it's got the like, it's like a hot pink color. And so you don't need many of them. So I've got one here, one there, and one up there. And they're great for the front. So if you've got like a hole in your landscape along the pathway or along your driveway, this is like an amazing filler for that. And then it kind of crawls into other things. So if you have it growing next to your aster twilight and if it's here, it gets about three foot sprawling and it'll go in between things. So it'll look like your hookah is blooming. It'll grow up into your aster and they'll, like it'll, people will think, is your aster blooming? It's like, no, it's actually the geranium snaking through things. So that's a, another nice little touch. Um, and then Carex, I, I'm sure you see these. Um, and Roy has been the pioneer of Carex. And there's so many different, they're so utilitarian. People have these mulch rings for days that, you know, that they add mulch to every year. They're not super interesting. And a lot of this you can add to those areas. And instead of have a living mulch, instead of putting mulch every year and spending money on chopped up wood, spend money on beauty. Um, then this is Carex albicans. It's a native Carex. And this is, I mean, they, like I said, I, when I saw Roy's first talk about Carex, I'm like, all right, Roy, I've trusted you on everything else, but what are these all about? And so this one, it gets about like probably eight inches tall, eight to 10 inches tall. And then it gets about a foot wide. And then it gets, like it blooms about this time with an airy little flower that sways and gives movement. And so if you see, I put them, I started in the front and just, you know, there, and it's gonna kind of where I have the flats laid out. So I kind of had all of these large blocks kind of all separated. And then I wanted the fluidity to be going through here with this carex. So I have kind of a river of carex coming through here, coming through here, and then dipping over there, 
There's another from that edge going through. So that just is like the thing that ties it all together. And we call that a matrix in the planting design world is when you have like all these groups and then when you have small like scatter plants and then a majority of one plant filling in the space like this carex is, that's a matrix. And so that is going to be our ground cover layer that suppresses the weeds. So that's what the whole, you might see this and go, wow, that's a lot of plants in there. But the reason for this spacing is that everything knits together and touches one another like they do in nature. And then that suppresses the weeds. So you have less weeds in the spring. And like I said, my parents, we've been working in their garden for 10 years, 12 years, and we've watered it five times in 10 years. And there's probably 4,000 plants there. And we, and the weeding takes minimum like 20 hours a year. It's just because of how close the plants are, creating this plant community where everything touches, using the right plants, and how great that is. So, you, like I said, you can see how full this flat is. This is exactly what that's gonna look like coming through here. And when you have these hostas, you know, it's gonna take them three to four years to touch one another. But if you have carex flowing through there, in the meantime, that's gonna help suppress your weeds. So it has a job to take, you know, it's got multiple jobs. It's beautiful, looks good, and it's semi evergreen and it, it stays mostly green all winter long. So I've been super happy with Carex albicans and there's so many wonderful ones. Um, I can't remember, Roy, what was this one that you brought over? There's granularis. Granularis? granularis. Yeah, so granularis. So, so if you want to like, you know, add a little bit, I mean, adding the Carex, multiple Carex together, putting three, some have blue hues. You can see how this one has that gorgeous, um, kind of gray, gray green color. And so having that pop out and doing like a little cluster of three or five of this one, you know, in a group here as that's going through just to add some more dimension and that different texture and color. So, and then there's some that are really blue. And so just adding blue to green to gray green and having those, you know, do this with the gray green one and then the green one here and then the blue one here. And so you, I mean, possibilities are endless. So, um, yeah, so this is uh, what I love to do and hope you enjoyed it. And let me know if you have any questions. Thanks for coming. Thank you for coming. And Austin came here when he was a young guy. His mom would drive him out here from Des Moines, Iowa <laughs> to hear this bohemian from Berwyn talking about <laughs> plants. And I kept learning and learning and still I'm an intern at this. And then all of a sudden, Austin created this world for himself. He created who he is with his family's help, and he's become one of the best designers in the world. And the thing he pays attention to, he pays attention to the art form. This is an art form. Again, this isn't yard work. This is an art form. And he pays attention to the social awareness of plants and how they live together, just like you do in your community wherever you live. So I want to introduce Austin to you. And oh, thank you. He's amazing. That's why I'm here, like where it all started. And I heard Roy speak back in 2017 when I was a freshman in college. He came and spoke at Iowa State University. And it was a perennial Saturday and my uh, owner of the company that I was working for paid for me to go that day and he was there and I was mind blown <laughs> and just hearing the passion he had <clears throat> but yeah so the passion he had for plants and the way he put them together and the pictures he showed were so moving and I said, you know, and the way the theories he was talking about how to use plants and where they come from. And, you know, people want long blooming plants, lower maintenance. And, and then the way he talked about it with emotion just like took me from the first second. I'm like, that's exactly what I want to do. And I want to share that with people. So I tried to, you know, I'm like, how do I learn this? What do I do? And then he's just like, I don't know, just, you know, play with plants and, you know, just keep growing things. And that's how you learn from plants. They tell you what they like, what they don't like. And that's the best thing you can do. So uh, the next year I had an internship in Northern um, Chicago and 
my family wanted to do a summer vacation. I was like, oh, why? we've been wanting to go to the Lake Geneva area, and then Roy is nearby at Northwind, and so we can kind of get two in one. And so uh, they drove the seven hours, and we came here, and we're just amazed. And Roy had a talk that weekend, and um, so we would come every year. He would do like four lectures a year and talk about different things, what gardens should look like in fall, appreciating yellows and browns in the winter and the seed heads. We don't have to make everything look like lollipops and sterile and boring and, you know, how to leave things, make it look natural and beautiful. And so I couldn't hear it enough. And we came probably for like seven, eight years to those. And he's like, you can teach it now. But every time you always get a little piece of something different that you hadn't heard before. And your mind, it takes a long time to change your mind after we hear put four inches of mulch on every year and put you know, spray everything with uh, preen and pre-emergence and all these chemicals that we need to use. And so it's like to get yourself off of that regimen is really difficult. So um, yeah, so it took me a lot of time and then I um, really wanted to learn more. And I, after school, I graduated and went to work at a design build firm in Des Moines, Iowa. And they were using all the new upcoming hot perennials. And like Roy said, old is hot. And that's true because the old, older perennials that are long lasting, hardy, strong, native, non-native are the plants to use. And that's what you have here at Northwind. And so to, uh, so I uh, came here to talk to him and said, I need, or I, I, I wanted to go to Europe because that's where I thought all the gardening was because I, you know, in Iowa, there wasn't a whole lot in the, you know, I was from Carroll, Iowa, a small town of 10,000. And so I, I, in all the magazines, you see England and Germany and all these amazing places. So I bought a one-way ticket to Europe and then told Roy I was going. And he's like, oh, you need to meet Pete Aldoff. And I said, okay, whoever, you know, I wasn't really a familiar with him at that time. And so I went home and Googled him and found out he lived in the Netherlands. And he said, oh, he's nearby in Germany. Go check him out. And so if, um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but he did the Lurie Garden in Millennium Park and the High Line in New York City and projects all over the world. And so I showed up one day, just, you know, took a bus, a train, a car, and then walked to his house on the farm in the middle of nowhere in the Netherlands in Hummelow. And he graciously let me come in and talked for a little bit and told me that you need to take steps. You need to go work at a botanic garden. You need to go work at a trial display garden. You need to go to work at a nursery. You need to understand everybody's side of the story, where your plants come from. And so i did exactly that and he kind of led me to internships throughout Europe. So I did like a five year sabbatical in Europe um, each summer and then I'd go back home for the winter and like spring to make money for the next journey. And so I uh, just wanted to learn more and learn everything I could. And so I took all these bits and then uh, Roy, or then Pete asked me, he was doing a project in Iowa, a residential project and he asked me if I wanted to be a part of it. So then I volunteered to go and Roy and Pete were both there and I'm like, a dream come true. I'm 26 years old and I have two of the greats of plant, plantsman, uh, nursery knowledge, uh, 40, 50 years. And so why not learn from what they've learned for all these years, what they've killed, what they've had live. This is what the benefits of all of it that they've learned is what's on those shelves in the nursery. So it's all strong, tough stuff. So I was standing there and I had his plan and we're laying out 23,000 plants. And I stood there and we, Every plant I laid down, Pete was behind me telling me, well, this is why I laid this down because this plant likes to grow in large swaths in nature. And I like to put a dabble of these in because they seed around and they sprinkle where there's little bits of soil left. And so try to make it look natural, but yet aesthetically pleasing for the client or whoever the client may be. And so, yeah, so it's, that's kind of how it all started. And then I um, started my own business and uh, both Pete and Roy have been super supportive and I work on projects with them and I have my own clients and uh, the last three years I've been working on the redesign of the master plan of Millennium Park and so I've done about 20,000 square feet of Millennium Park in naturalistic design gardens. So about 15,000 of them are shade gardens. So if you get a chance to go down there, it's fun and really exciting. So check it out and then I've worked with other nurseries and clients from around the United States and. I love what I do and there's never a day of work. The front the, with the white flowers, that's polygonatum. And that is, yeah, polygonatum mult, uh, multifada. Oh wait, yeah, this one with the white bells on it. This grouping, yeah. Japanese forest grass. So Hakona Kloa Macra, 
Yeah, on the microphone. We'll have 10 minutes of Q&A. So you have 10 minutes. Okay. Or is yes, yes, yes. Yep. Is it, is yep, that's a Solomon, Solomon seal. Yep. Which ones are okay for deer? <laughs> so usually grasses are okay. Um, I would say like epimedium, I would think is pretty, is the rabbit or deer resistant. The aster is not completely. That If they're hidden within everything, um, you might be able to get away with it. But I know that's been one that they might munch a little bit on. The rabbits love the aster. Yeah, any aster, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I would say they don't like the hellebores because of the texture of the leaf. Um, I'm not sure about the uh, astrontia. I don't think, so. no, yeah, I don't think, but the astrontia is good, so that's deer rabbit resistant. The fern is deer rabbit resistant. I think the hookara, I would say, is deer rabbit resistant. The sedges, yep, sedges, the Hakonakloa, the, the, I think this would be the Aquilegia. So, yeah, and I... The other thing you have to look at with creatures is what, what causes their pressure and population growth. So it's really, it's not just, they, it's not that they won't or will eat everything, but it's the pressure of their population due to the, due to the food supply that also causes different degrees of damage. So some people may have nothing ever eaten. Other people, maybe they have to move to another home <laughs> <laughs> because of the pressure. Yeah. The, the astrantia, is there, I had, I had a lovely roommate and then it died off after about eight yeah. years. Is that it likes well-drained, so it doesn't do well in clay. Um, it's, Can you please repeat the question? But yeah, so the astrantia, she said she had a large group that was gorgeous for a few years and then it just like, went away and so some things you know if you love it and you're like okay it did me good for three years and i love it like you can put it in it's better than an annual and uh and then this one if it's it likes a little bit moisture well drained so if you had like a loam clay that's still drained through the winter or like a higher spot or like a slope like these would do well but yeah it needs like a little bit more moisture it's probably the the thing in here that maybe needs a little bit more moisture but i think this one is like one of the more drought tolerant ones of the Astrantias. I'll add something to that. Brent Horvath is here from yeah. Intrinsic Nursery in Hebron. Yeah, so. Intrinsic Perennial Gardens. For 21 years, I've had one Astrantia live at Northwind. Every, everything I planted died. Yeah. I have one, it's over by the retail. Brent turned me on to sparkling, was it sparkling? Yeah, sparkling stars? pink. Pink sparkling so stars. Told me this pink sparkling was, stars. Uh, After three years of it living, I decided to start selling it because our goal is to sell plants that live Flip. well in this region. So I'd say, I'd say, this, you know, I'm pretty content after not having something for 21 years to have this live for three years. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. Um, can, you, can you give us a diagram or something of the, what you got going here? It's right here. I can. I can create one and send it over to them to, you know, share it on the website. Um, and they've got, you know, they have a plant list. Um, you can take some pictures. This will be planted here. Yeah, this is going to be planted in here for uh, forever. <laughs> I'll live in infamy. Yeah, sorry, one second. Yeah, sorry, one second. So it's, a, it's about the plant choice and the knowledge of the plant. And so nothing in here will take over. Like I said, the only thing is that aster has its you know, way. And if you have it in a group, they're just going to collide into one another. But if, and then what happens? Okay. 
yeah, so they're going to keep living in harmony right here. And then right here, if you want, you know, it's going to get bigger and would probably outcompete with this. But if I put this and the Hakona Kloa next to one another, they're both really tough crowns and tough plants and they'll be fine and they'll just go up one, uh, up one another. But if you're gardening and you go out there in the spring and you're like, oh, it's getting close, you pull out one of the, you know, you just pull out the, the furthest away sucker or the, the rhizome and then you have that line and then it's good for another year. So it just depends on how much gardening you wanna do. If you wanna do, if you don't mind doing that once a year and going through there and taking that out after the third or fourth year, uh, that's fine, but nothing here, like I said, is an aggressive cedar. If you have aggressive cedars, I suggest putting those in, I learned from Roy, uh, three to four years after the first installation. So this is like your basic ground cover layer. And so you have this in, and then later you're like, ooh, I wanna try some echinacea. That's a little bit heavier of a spreader, or I wanna try uh, an echinops, or you know these things that you're talking about that are very um, rambunctious. And so you can add those in later, but wait until the plants get full and they start filling in and touching one another, then you can add those beautiful monsters. But then, then when they're all established and they're, they've grown together, they're touching, yeah. and you want to do some work in the middle, then you're trampling over. I'm just. There's room, you just got to do a little dance. <laughs> there's yeah, there's always room, and like I said, there's. Uh, yeah. They, they, they see them everywhere. Yeah. Well, you're using what you're using. You're using you're using perennials that are thugs and bullies. Yeah. Yes. When you're planting thugs. Get rid of them. <laughs> how do you? There's no control for that. And then, then the, the the wind blows yeah. the seed. You want to you, you want to start with plants that respect their space, respect and come to know you, and you come to know them. And when you put in plants that respect their space, you enhance them later with the bullies because when these plants are adult they can put up with a bully in the neighborhood. If you put the bullies in right away, they're gonna see it everywhere, take over, and all you're doing is you're just, you're, you're doing yard work. You're yeah. not gardening. Okay. You're keeping control of thugs and bullies, and they run the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, next question. Add a little bit to that, Austin, real quick, since this is what we have at home. I'm Austin's mom, and um, if I get out there in the spring, I'm usually pretty well done weeding by around that 7th to 10th of June where I can still get in there. I don't have to go in there after that because it's, it's all touching and it's, oh. the weeding done might be one or two, two here and there, but yeah. if you get sure, in there in the spring, you yeah. keep it under control. Well, no, yeah, and then, yeah, and then after June, then it's just selective pruning and you can go out there with your glass of wine. You don't need both hands. You just need one <laughs> and you can go and you're like, okay, there's one weed there, there's one weed there and you're good to go. So, yeah. The black, black walnut. Black walnut. Yeah. That's all we got here. Yeah. yeah. It's all black walnut. It's all black walnut. Oh if you're putting in annuals or vegetables, they cannot live under a black walnut. There's a lot of plants. So that's 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 where we, we live. We we don't we we live without questioning things. We keep repeating over and over the same activity, but we don't question it. Like wood mulch. We never question why do we put wood mulch everywhere? We never question it. We continue to do it. So we continue to do the most unhealthy thing you can do for any plant on earth is surround them with wood. And we've never questioned why we do it. Well, we, I don't know. It's just because everybody else does it. So when you look at a walnut tree, you look at how many things on earth has lived under a walnut tree happily. Well, you just mimic the genus and the species. It's just, it's just, the cool part is we're in such a transformational period in horticulture right now. We have horticulture intermingling with environmentalism. And it, we're, we're just, it's just it's such an exciting period to be alive yeah. in horticulture. I'm thankful for people, people like healthier you. Healthier and healthier because we, there's no other choice. It, it's, just, it's just too cool. Yeah. So in the spring, I didn't mention, so after you enjoy the beauty of the structure all winter long, then you come through with a, a mulching lawnmower over top of this and you mow it over with a four inch on a four inch deck on the highest deck and then you mulch it over at the end once your bulbs start coming up and so I always do a bulb layer and so you have things that are coming up in 
the snow drops, the you know, China docks, all of that stuff, those layers of bulbs coming up until your first aquilegia blooms or columbine. And so having that in the fall, plant your bulb layer. And then in the spring, right when you see your first bulb foliage coming up, mow the garden over. So there you're not going through and doing every little you know, clipping. You go through, you mow it down. The leaf litter stays. And then that is your mulch, your little layer of mulch until everything fills in and touches. And you don't have to go buy hundreds, thousands of dollars of mulch. So you're saving money and your plants are an investment. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah, so we use Roundup one time to kill everything at a diluted um, mixture and then wait till, you know, if I'm doing like a grass area and I want to kill the grass, I spray it and then we plant right into the dead grass because that is holding moisture and that's where your most nutrient soil is. And then that helps also suppress the weeds. So, and then you can add a layer of leaf mulch if you don't want to look at bright yellow, you know, turf, uh, like leaf mulch or pine fines, the smallest, pine, the smallest ground up wood of pine fines because those actually will break down over time and some of the other hardwood mulches they just keep collecting and when you keep adding that next to the crown of the plant um, that moisture stays there and you keep adding that two inches of mulch every year that moisture stays and then in the winter when it's a wet winter and you say oh your perennial died because it was a polar vortex or this or that no it's because your layer of mulch that you had around there the freeze thaw kills the crown of the plant because that mulch stays wet all winter long. So you're killing your own plants by adding mulch every year. In terms of just replenishing soil that you know is kind of needs replenishing, what do you like recommend for the dirt that needs to be revitalized for your plant? So a lot of people when I go to clients are like, we have terrible dirt, we have terrible soil, and I've never amended soil. I've always just worked with what I have. So I go there and I'm like, I have clay soil. I'm not going to change what Mother Nature's had here for ever. So I work with what I have and if it's clay then I make sure that I don't put the things that don't like the clevy he heavy clay or you know it's just like you're not gonna you can change it for a year or something but then eventually that amendment that you put in is going to run off and you know like at Millennium Park I, we have a green roof. Um, all of the park is a green roof and so then we added in a little bit of compost because it's been there for 20 years and so we're just added in a little bit of nutrients and that was it but otherwise i've never amended any soils of any gardens i've ever created so <laughs> yeah thank you so much for being here i enjoyed it thank you thank you thank you thank you. Okay, well, I want to thank you all for coming and coming to visit with austin and i want to thank austin for coming out and his family this was too good and if you're interested in uh wondering we, we do have all these plants for sale and our team is waiting up there <laughs> but the thing i would recommend it's not that i don't want to sell you plants but i but think think out too how you're going to put them in so you you don't want to spontaneously buy something run home and wonder what to do with it go home and come back yeah if you think about it but have a plan i had an uncle i always hid from him when i was a kid uncle tony and why did i always hide from uncle tony not all the time, but generally. Because he'd come over with his fedora and his cigar. I'm like 12 years old. Roy, what are you going to do with your life? All I want to do is play baseball. That was my life. Because if you fail to play, you play to fail.